Mommy, Daddy, you want to hear what I've been learning in school? The sweet words of my then third grade daughter at dinner one night. Well, of course, sweetie. Tell us, what have you been learning? Well, we've been studying countries, and everybody gets a country, and I picked Thailand. And she began to tell us about the people and the culture of Thailand. And my five-year-old son was sitting right next to me, and he kept trying to interrupt. He had something important to say. We'd say, Colin, just hang on. Let your, finish, let your sister finish, and then it'll be your turn. Five-year-olds don't have a good sense of time and turn and all those things, of course. My daughter continued telling her story about the currency, the geography, the culture. And at one point, my wise wife realized this boy is about to burst. So we've got to let a little bit of air out of the balloon. So she paused Elise and said, Colin, okay, it's your turn. What would you like to share? Now, Colin at this time had a missing front tooth. Boys will be boys, right? He said, Mommy, Daddy, look what I can do. What, Colin, what can you do? He then proceeded to suck an entire spaghetti string up through the hole in his teeth. <laughs> yes, another proud daddy moment for sure. As it turns out, we never outgrow our need to be listened to, to be understood, and to be known. Your people the leaders on your team, your employees, and your family members have this exact same need. So you've, you've come to a talk about listening, right? Does anyone else see a bit of an irony in that? I mean, they call me a guest speaker after all. Uh, be honest, would you have come if they had called me a guest listener? <laughs> Probably not. You see, communicating, speaking in particular, is so an important part of our leadership culture, right? It's about speaking well, casting vision, motivating people around a common purpose. How important is listening in your leadership? Okay, I want to do a quick poll with you. Keep the answer to yourself for a moment. On a scale of one to 10, how good of a listener are you? So one is an excellent listener, or 10 is an excellent listener. One is a very poor listener. Get the score in your head. Now when you've got that, I'd like you to take 10 seconds and share that with two people and get the, the scores from two other people back and then add those three scores up your, in your mind and hold that for a moment. Ready, go. Thank you. Rick, take the average. This is an invitation for everyone. Take all three numbers. You've added them up now. Divide by three. If the math gets a little bit funky, just round to the nearest half point. Uh, Rick is a CPA. So Rick, what was the average of your three data points? Seven. Thank you. Over here, what was your three? Average of four. Welcome, you're in the right place. <laughs> That's awesome. Over here at this table. 5.5. Okay, over here. Six. Back of the bus. Four. 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 A seven? Okay, back here. Four. A four. 
Six. Over here, someone else? Five. Five, okay. Well, sounds like on average, Rick, have you done the math? Sounds like about an average group. High achievers at your table. Rick, your table, I think, uh, confirms five decades of research. Nearly everyone in North America believes they're an above average listener, right? Isn't that how this thing sort of goes sometimes? <laughs> Up to 60% of our total communication package is listening. Now that might be plus or minus for your particular situation. I'd like you to imagine every time you have a conversation with someone, they're filling up cupfuls of meaning. And in that conversation, certainly not every conversation, where's the report, why is it late, those kinds of things, lower level conversations, but for several conversations throughout your day, someone's filling up cupfuls of meaning for you. So one of these cupfuls, they might be in that conversation sharing about their hopes and dreams. They might be giving you some clues about what their aspirations are, what they're longing for. They might be giving you clues about their emotions and what's important to them with their energies in that conversation. You might be hearing more about their values. Their deeply held beliefs might be underlying some of the things that they're sharing about. You might even, in one of these other cups, be getting lots of meaning around their resistance, what's holding them back. If you listen carefully, you can hear some of these threads in every conversation, every cup full of meaning. What do we do with these cupfuls of meaning? We drop 75% of the meaning in our conversations. Is that crazy? But it was never meant to be like that. We can do better. For our team's sake, for our family's sake, we can do better. For the rest of our time today, I'd like you to consider a question. So here's the question. What could it look feel, sound like for you to listen to people so well that they flourish? What could it look like, feel like, or sound like for you to listen so well to people that they just flat out flourish? I'm going to start with the why on this. We know that that is really the most important because at the, at the center of this whole venture of listening, of extravagant listening, it's a heart issue. It's a question of motive and intent. It's a question of the will. So we're going to spend a lot of time around the why. We're going to look at some biblical examples. We're going to move into some of the research around it. And then we'll move into some of the how. I'll give you a few practical takeaways that you can take, take back. in the most, one of the top 10 leadership articles in HBR, Harvard Business Review, Peter Drucker gives eight practices for an executive uh, effectiveness. And at the end of this article, he says, I'm gonna elevate this to the level of a rule. This is so important, I elevate it to the level of the rule. Listen first, speak last. Sounds pretty obvious, right? And yet when Peter Drucker says it, and does so eloquently, we salute it, we pay attention to it. A couple thousand years earlier, 
James, the half-brother of Jesus, said, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. This has been around for a while, of course. My, my proposition to you this afternoon is this. Every leader should empower others. Why? Because of three spheres of impact. Three spheres of impact. It's going to be personally, interpersonally, and organizationally. We'll get to those in a moment. Consider these words written by King David in Psalm 5, verses 1 through 3. Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my lament. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. In Psalm 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. We get this picture throughout Scripture of when God has a very intimate relationship with a person and a person with God, it's based on hearing. Of the five different senses, the verb forms of those senses, taste, touch, hear, and, and so on. Uh, in the original languages, Hebrew and Greek, throughout scripture, it turns out to hear or to listen shows up 49% of the time of those five senses. Hearing is a big deal to God and relationship, a deep, resonant, intimate relationship with God seems to be very heavily based on listening to one another, man to God and God to man. In Solomon's prayer for dedication for the temple after he had finished building it, in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, 12 times in that chapter alone, he pleads with God to listen to Israel when he knows that they're going to go astray in the future. And just for good measure, at the end of that chapter, he says, turn your ear to us, O Lord. By contrast, when Israel is going astray from God, here's what this looks like in terms of listening language. Amos 5, verses 22 and 23. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. He goes on to say in Amos chapter 8, verse 11, the days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. We have pictures of great intimacy with God through listening. And where there's enough rebelliousness towards God and humans have broken off that relationship, God breaks off the, the, that hearing relationship as well. Let's turn to the New Testament. Mark chapter 12, it's a great picture of the two great commandments, right? The, uh, someone that comes up and asks Jesus, what are the two, great, what's the greatest commandment? And what does he say? Somebody knows it. What does he say? Yes, yes, exactly. And that's where we get the first two commandments. Something that we often skip over in that is that he's actually quoting Israel's oldest and dearest prayer called the Shema. Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. So Jesus actually starts the greatest commandment with hear. 
What's the greatest commandment? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself is the second commandment. Here is throughout entire scripture. Luke chapter 8, verse 8. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Verse 18. Jesus says, consider carefully how you listen. Verse 21. There's this question that pops up around, who are my brothers and sisters? You know, they're, they're, they're waiting out for you, Jesus. Come, come check them out. And he asked, who are they? He said, he replied, my mothers and brothers are those who hear, those who hear God's word and put it into practice. <clears throat> and then in the transfiguration, Luke chapter 9, it's in all three synoptic gospels, but in verse 35, there's this voice from heaven. Across those three Gospels, there's a little bit of variance as to what is emphasized by each of those Gospel writers. Voice from the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen. Now Matthew and John say, whom I love. Uh, but all three of them say this to end it. This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Now, doesn't it seem reasonable? There's a lot of things God could have said at that point about Jesus. Follow him. That would have been a very reasonable thing for God to say. Trust him. Believe in him. Follow his example. I just find it very interesting that God, the voice from heaven at that particular point, chooses to say, listen to him. Back to the proposition. Every leader should empower others with extravagant listening. Because of a personal impact it makes. This comes right out of the research, every single one of these points. It's been shown that it actually lowers the stress level of the employee when the boss uses these generous, extravagant listening disciplines. Okay. Uh, another interesting note about this, uh, Seth Horowitz is a neuroscience researcher on the properties of sound and its impact to, to people. And he reports in his book, The Universal Sense, that it's been, uh, several studies have shown that birds in urban environments have higher stress levels because they have to call louder so that their bird mates can hear them. Isn't that interesting? It's been shown in humans in working environments as well. When the boss doesn't listen, doesn't show that they really connect and listen, stress levels go up for humans. And likewise, when they listen really well, it lowers the cortisol stress levels. It increases self-clarity. For those of you who are working with a convened chair or an executive coach, perhaps you've experienced this. They listen well, and you get to hear yourself think. Sometimes for the very first time on a particular topic, you develop a whole lot more clarity in having someone listen extravagantly to you. Research also shows that it increases personal agency. I went through this with my daughter. She said, yeah, this, I, I, this is what looks good. I don't know what personal agency is, though. It's the ability to get stuff done. You can flat get stuff done. I had a life-changing experience. September 19th, 2012, that will forever stay in my memory and has forever changed how I engage the world. I was listened to generously. and it has changed how I engage with my family, how I engage with my convene members and other people. It was huge in my life. 
it increases emotional and physical well-being. Again, this is according to the research. The industrial psychologists and social psychologists who have done these studies have discovered that when, when these managers, when these leaders are listening generously, these other things happen. Uh, they've actually, in one of these studies of long-term care patients in a facility, they actually report, patients who report that their nurses and their uh, caregivers listen generously to them, they have fewer symptoms, and they have a better experience of the care environment. Interpersonal impact. It creates positive attitude changes when people listen generously to one another. One of the studies on this came from MIT, some MIT researchers. They took two different people groups and they, they uh, put people together from uh, immigrants from Mexico and white Arizonans. So a group in power and a group without power and they put these people in a room. When the people in power listened to the story of the person out of power, and they were able to accurately summarize and play that back to, the, to them, not just hear it and get the information, okay, interesting, but actually play that back in summary form, the attitudes improved on the people group out of power. They also did this with Palestinians and Israelis the exact same thing happened. It increases trust levels in the work environment. It improves problem solving. There's a research uh, st study on couples, romantic couples, married couples, and they found that when they were able to actively, generously, extravagantly listen to one another, their problem solving increased and the relationship stability increased as well. Organizationally, all right, that sounds fine and dandy at a personal level, interpersonal level for friends going out to coffee, but what about the work environment? Here's what the research shows. When the leader listens, it starts to foster a learning environment. This is out of Cornell uh, School of Hospitality, the, ho the hotel management school. They found that it facilitates greater execution when people are in learning mode. It increases employee empowerment as well. A CEO friend of mine called me up several months ago, and in that conversation he said, Todd, my people just aren't listening to me. I keep telling them the same thing, they don't get it. My question for him and my question for you, are you listening to them? Finally, the folks at Cornell tied these three factors to a noticeable increase in organizational performance and profitability. And those of us who are we're learning about servant leadership and we're immersed in that worldview from a faith perspective, certainly, it starts with the heart, right? Yeah, profit's important, gotta have profit, and there's so many other wonderful reasons to engage this as well. Okay. You ready to put this into practice? All right. Let's try this out. Got a movie clip for you here. Short video clip. This is from the movie Still Alice with Julianne Moore. So we've got a short scene with, with Julianne Moore and her daughter. Julianne Moore is in the, in the story, she is a professor of linguistics at Columbia University. It's a very cerebral family. This one daughter wants to be an actor, an actress. And she goes off and she does that. And so there's this little bit of a weird dynamic that develops in the beginning of the movie 
around her desire to go off and be an actress and not go to college. Right? This is like heresy in this family. So there's a little bit of a riff there. This is later in the movie. Julianne Moore has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, early onset Alzheimer's. And she is starting to feel the effects of this disease. And here's the conversation that takes place between the two of them while they're out on vacation. I want you to pay attention to the conversation. Listen to the feelings, the emotions of what's going on for Julianne Moore, the mom, as she speaks to her daughter. And then pay attention to what does the daughter do well in this conversation, okay? All right, there's gonna be a quiz. What is Julianne feeling? Scared, yeah, thank you, thank you. Who else? Frustrated, yeah, yeah. Touch that her daughter would ask, yeah, great pickup. Angry, angry. Hopelessness. What was that? Out of control, yeah. Weak. Yeah. What else? Who said that? Lost. What gave you the sense that she was lost? Yeah. She's lost her identity. She didn't know who she is anymore, she said. Yeah. Wow, great pickups. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sad, which leads to this hopelessness. Oh, all great pickups. These are these cupfuls of meaning that people are pouring into our conversations. May we catch more of these cupfuls, just like what you guys are doing right now. What did the daughter do well in this conversation? She listens. Eye contact. Yeah. Asked a great question. Yeah. Didn't text. Empathy. What was that? Didn't text. Didn't text. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't solve problems. Yeah, right. Really just try to want, like, what is it like? And it was a, it was a great question. It was, it was a very considered, deep, I am here, I am ready to listen kind of a question, wasn't it? It wasn't just, hey, how's it going? Now, there's plenty of room in our world for that. That was just, I thought, very well done. Yeah, and the facial motion, that's, wow, that must be, that must be horrible. Now, biblically, now this is something I'm wrestling with. I, I was talking about this with Mark at dinner the other night. Biblically, what it means to listen in the context of listening to God, there needs to be an obedience component 
to the listening with God. Isn't that interesting? Right? James talks about it. Um, don't just listen, but listen and do what it says. I think the song this morning uh, sang about that. I would submit to you that extravagant listening requires a response on our part for it to be extravagant listening. It's not just taking it in. Some of us need to work on our facial response to our speakers. Not me personally, but you know, people that you're having conversation with. Right? Inform your face that you're having a conversation. Right? I work with some CEOs, the entire one-on-one, -on -one, they're like this sometimes. They're taking it all in but the other person has no clue where you are in this conversation. Some of them interpret, and here's the thing, with bosses, with CEOs, the smallest little things that you do get multiplied so big and they get interpreted in such big ways. Back in the day when you maybe were an individual contributor, it didn't have that same level of significance, did it? But now it's a different deal, right? Oh yeah. And so if you're doing this bit, or, or whatever it is, that gets translated into a whole new meeting, and oh my goodness, Rick's mad at me. No, Rick was just, he was just paying attention. He was concentrating at what something you said made him think about something. We got to be dialed in and inform our faces that we want to be generous, extravagant listeners. Do you have a question? A comment, please. Ah, yeah. That's a distractor for us. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. I couldn't keep it to 10, so I'm giving you a top 12 list of extravagant listening. This is a matter of the heart, first and foremost. If you think you're an excellent listener, which we heard the scores, so we've got the high achieving table. Um, but I think you, it, it really needs to start with a choice, a decision of the will. It's a heart issue, right? So choose to be an extravagant listener. Create structure to help you. Here's an example. Calendars. We all, most of us use calendars for appointments and all the rest of it. And instead of having lunch with John on your calendar, how about something like listen well with John? Not listen to John, listen with John, right? Create this partnership experience with John. Just put it in your calendar that way. Just book your calendars that way, your appointments. So that when you see that calendar pop up, that's an instant reminder, that's structure. This is what I'm about. This is the mission I'm engaging at 2.30. Cultivate silence. Research shows that two minutes of silence is the best way to relax your brain and calm yourself. Neurologically speaking, your brain goes into a new mode when you can have two minutes of silence. Turn off the phone, get away from the computer, leave the office if you have to, go for a walk, go somewhere. You may use the earplugs, you may keep the earplugs. Do something to cultivate two minutes of silence, especially if you're getting ready to go into a big time meeting that you know this is drawn upon your faculties to really engage this important conversation, somewhere, get some silence. It really helps. It's better than music, actually, uh, neurologically speaking, in terms of what it'll do uh, in your brain. Use both ears. Sounds goofy. Neurologically, 
you all are probably familiar with, we have one hemisphere or the other that's dominant in our brain. Right hemisphere, left hemisphere. Left tends to deal with facts, logic, figures, things like that. The right tends to uh, deal, process more on, you know, emotion and meaning and subtleties and nuances, things like that. The, rights, the right hemisphere in our brain controls the faculties on the left side of our body. It processes information from our ears, processes information from our, our, from our left ear, from our, our left eye, and uh, our, uh, works with our left hand as well. The opposite is true as well. Left brain deals with input from the right ear, right eye, and so on. Now, I've gone through a brain profile, as uh, some of our members in our group have, and under stress, your non-dominant hemisphere is going to be in a severely degraded mode, and it's not going to be able to process information nearly as well. It's like it's gone for the most part. So the bad news for me, because I'm right-handed and right-brained, if my, uh, under, under severe stress, I'll still be able to hear you, I'll still be able to see what's going on because my right brain is still functioning well. However, my right hand is gonna not be nearly as dexterous, so I make a lousy Navy SEAL because I'm not gonna be able to take care of the crisis in the moment with my right hand, because I'm right-handed. So what are the implications for leadership? If you are using one of these, you may be missing out on at least 50% of the conversation. And it's actually probably more than that, right? The nonverbal content of a conversation is up to 93% of the content, okay? So if you've got the earpiece in the wrong ear, you're not hearing any of the emotional content. You're just hearing the facts and figures and this sounds really confusing and I can't talk to this person anymore. If you have it on you know, maybe the other ear and you're getting all emotion, uh, that can cloud the picture as well. Uh, I shared this information with a good friend of mine uh, a, a while ago, and, uh, and he shared it with some, some uh, people that he works with, that he coaches. And the people came back and said, oh my goodness, my wife, in this one case, my wife is deaf in one ear. And Every, she's just so emotional and, uh, because all she's hearing is the emotional content of the conversation and it just builds up and we get this amygdala hijack, right? This, this uh, emotion center in our brain gets flooded with chemicals and it can't deal. It's checked out and the, the higher level executive functions in our brain are shutting back down. And it's just in a fight, flight, or freeze mode at that point and the conversation cannot continue. So, you are missing a lot of the conversation when you're using this. I strongly recommend that you chuck this. For my coaching conversations, I've, uh, when I, my coaching over the phone, I've had a one headset piece for years. When I read this research, I changed out the headset, got two ears, and oh my goodness. The sound goes from here to feeling like it's coming, emanating right from the middle of my brain. It's so cool. I hear these people in high def. Uh, it's an important consideration for you. Set a listening goal for conversation. Be intentional. This particular converse, not conversation in general, a particular conversation. Now, our wills, our willpower, is really good at sort of big decisions like, should we move? Should we start a business? Should we have kids? Where to go to college? But small decisions like, I got to do something tomorrow or, you know, stop smoking or have a great conversation with someone, our willpowers are lousy. So we need the structure. So set a goal. Set a goal for the conversation. So if it was this Julianne Moore conversation, maybe it's, 
okay, I really want to hear mom's emotion around what it's like to have Alzheimer's. Set that goal for yourself. So with your employee, with your spouse, with your teenagers, I was on a chair call a couple of months ago in the afternoon, and my kids came home from school, and I could just tell that there was a different vibe when they walked in the house. This was not normal. There were pouty, sad faces, and one made a beeline upstairs, the other made a beeline to the living room, and I excused myself from that call. I went and sat with my daughter on the couch, and I spent about a minute, a full minute, just tuning in to what's her body language right now before I say a thing and like blow it all, right? You guys been there with your teenagers? And so I read this, and I gently said, you look sad. And she said, yeah. And she started telling me all about what went on in the conversation in the car ride on the way home from school with her brother. And we spent the next hour and a half in sweet daddy-daughter conversation time. Set a listening goal for your conversations. Pray. Pray. Invite the Holy Spirit alongside. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He helps us to hear what we need to hear from God and from other people. Expect to hear something valuable. Researchers discovered that in anticipation of hearing something, our auditory networks in our cortex activate in anticipation of hearing something. So we can, we can set up our brain to listen more efficiently when we expect to hear something. We're like, oh yeah, Sally Jo, yeah, worst employee. She's never had anything good to say, right? And you start building this self-talk in, and you're like, she's got nothing for me here. Then that's what you're going to hear most often. Make it about them. This isn't about you getting information. This is not about you learning more. You'll, you'll get that. You'll get that by default. This is about creating an exceptional, an extravagant, if you will, listening environment, listening experience for the speaker so that they can be transformed. Servant leadership right where the rubber meets the road. Notice your triggers before you get into a conversation. Oh. Thanksgiving dinner, whenever Uncle Al gets on that mode that just ticks me off and that takes me back to when I was eight years old, back in the backyard, and he did this thing, and, right? and it takes you to this place that you're just like, ah, that triggered me again. Pay attention, know them ahead of time, so that they don't hijack you. There's a lot of hard work involved in this, by the way. Hold your pearls. Um, there is someone in this room, a good friend of mine, who's flat out transformed lives by extravagant listening. I had a conversation with one of those people or on several occasions that he is transformed through extravagant listening. This person said about the person who is listening to her, it has flat changed my life. And she says this without exception or qualification. She says, he didn't try to fix me. He didn't judge me. He didn't try to spiritualize on me. He listened to my mess. He listened to who I really was, and he cared about me. Hold your pearls, your advice, your wisdom. There's time for that, right? Jesus teaches, right? He shares wisdom. Extravagant listening, there's, that's a different experience, okay? Hold those pearls during that moment because you will get so much and you will earn the right to share those pearls later on. This is, again, the active part of this experience is paraphrase their words and reflect their emotions. The daughter said, that's horrible. That must be horrible. 
right? There's any number, all, all the examples that you shared could have been very valid responses for her as well. But reflect those emotions. That's how people know that you're dialed in. There's lots of research that bears out that, oh yeah, if you're just doing the, hmm, uh-huh, uh-huh, right, okay, yeah. That's helpful. If, if that's sort of your next baby step, that's awesome. And there's so much more available to you in terms of tools in that conversation so the person really felt, feels heard. Finally, be okay with silence. Be okay with silence. Uh, as far as the, uh, the active part of that listening conversation is, so the question is, uh, is silent, are you just checked out when you're silent? Or is that, you know, is that like a valid response in there? Is that kind of the question? T to ask another question? Okay. Oh, sure, sure. Questions are very helpful in this piece. So long as they're questions that help them share more rather than being just uh, nagging questions, or that kind of thing, does that make sense? The silence part of it, well, I guess what I would emphasize on that is some people struggle trying to figure out what's really going on for them, and they need time. And the question that you just asked, when they don't respond right away, we feel like we need to fill that space sometimes, and so we ask the next question, or we, we stack another question onto it, or we, we say something else to try to get them to move further. And, and a friend of mine, the way he puts it is, let that drip deeper. It's dripping deeper into the soil. So let that get there, and then it'll come back up, and they'll be able to give you a thoughtful response sometimes, oftentimes. So be okay with silence. Uh, in the Fierce Conversations training, it's called, let silence do the heavy lifting. Right? Let them really cogitate on whatever that is. Okay. I'd like you to pair up when I give you the go, and we're gonna finish with this exercise, and then I'll read you uh, a little piece to, to close our time together. I want you to pair up, and uh, you're gonna figure out who is going to be person A and who's going to be person B. So quickly do that and bring it back to me, please. A, whoever is A, they will be the person speaking, and B will be the person listening, listening generously, using the methods that we've just spoken about. Okay, so A will be speaking, B will be listening generously. Okay, and I would invite you to share something, uh, a, a significant event, say from the last 30 days. Before you do that, I would like to invite all of you to take out, if you have them, some of you guys in the back, we didn't have enough, uh, take out the ear plugs. This is optional, but I invite you to put in the ear plugs and let's experience a moment of silence. I'll ring the chimes again when it's time to bring your attention back, but go ahead and put in the ear plugs and let's just hold it for a minute or two Everybody, everybody, yeah. So you can experience a little bit of silence. And I invite you to be silent as we do this piece. Have your conversation, please. In one word, what was your experience of being listened to? Relieved, fulfilled. Thank you. Thank you. Connectivity. Connectivity. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciated. Validated. Appreciated. Valued. Valued. Yeah. Concerned. Concerned. Yeah. I'm talking to Sarah over here. She wasn't trying to fix it. Now I'm talking about where she talked to you. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Really dialed in, listening. Thankfulness. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank 
to you. Emotional connection. Sweet. Yeah. Encouraged. Encouraged. Thank you. Admired. All right. Cool. Comfortable. 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 Important. Important. Wow. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you. Wish we had more time to reciprocate and go through that. Only half of you are going out feeling great about it. <laughs> <laughs> In closing, I would like to read you this manifesto. A manifesto is a declaration of intent. Okay? Perhaps you've heard this song, Manifesto, right? It's, it's Jesus' manifesto. This I call the extravagant listening manifesto for leaders. My leadership matters yet it's not about me. I lead so that others may flourish. Great flourishing requires great listening. So I lead with extravagant listening. The famine of hearing is over. At my table, there is a feast of listening. I cultivate high impact listening experiences so that others feel safe, known, and understood. I listen deeply. I savor the meaning and they feel validated. I am for them. I listen into relationship. As I listen, I am fully present in the moment to the other. For my listening as leader, carries great power to confer value, dignity, and respect. I am a trustworthy listener. I listen for more meaning, more impact, and more flourishing. Because I lean into listening experiences with intention, people gain greater clarity, courage, and capacity. May those who sit at my table flourish because I have listened well. I thank you for listening.